Hi, my name is Ken Franchak, and my definition of relentless is a willingness to kick down a door even when you don't know what's on the other side of it. Never be afraid, be relentless, kick the door down and find out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Relentless Podcast. We are so excited about our guest today, Mr. Ken Franchuk, the general manager of Crystal Glass Canada. You are going to want to hear what Ken has to talk about because this guy went from being homeless to the absolute pursuit of excellence in business. Take a listen. All right, it is so good to be here on the Relentless Podcast with a very special guest, a good friend of mine I've known for a long time. Ken Franchuk from Crystal Glass, the general manager of Crystal Glass Canada. Uh, thanks for being here. We're glad you're you're joining us. You know what? There was nothing else I was going to do. It's minus 30 out there. I yeah. mean, I might as well come visit you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great. Uh, but yet the studio is a little cold today. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's, it's very fine. David Letterman-ish. I feel awake. Yeah. I feel awake. David Letterman used to have his studio so cold. And that was just because so people wouldn't be sweating and they'd be. So I feel like I you look, almost like David Letterman. You look a little like David Letterman Very much right now. Like David yeah, Letterman. yeah, you look good. And you're a big time guest for us. So this is wow. Great. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> Ken, we've known each other. I, I was trying to think of this on the way over for sh- I want to say a good eight years. I think. Yeah, I oh. was going to say ten. So it's. I mean, it may not be ten, but yeah, yeah. long time. Eight for to ten sure. years. Yep. Met through our work. Uh, I'm the executive director of You Can Use Services. You are the general manager of Crystal Glass Canada. And you came out through a mutual friend to one of our comedy nights. That's and that's right. the first time we met. And I think right away, our work resonated with you. And you and I ended up meeting, you made a nice size donation, which was very generous, on your card and said, call me. And so I did. Yeah, we well, because of the jo- the donation is what That's it was. Right. I know it was, uh, hey, this guy gave me money. I'm going to call him. I'm going to call him. Yeah. Right? And then we ended up doing lunch, <laughs> and we just clicked. Yeah. We clicked, For right? sure we did. Um, similar sense of humor, which is probably really demented and bad. Yeah, those jokes won't work here. No, they we'll, we'll, keep we'll keep those ones uh, yeah. to ourselves. And then just lots of things in common, and and just really enjoyed hanging out, and, and you've become a huge supporter of our organization, which I'm thankful for. But- you're here today to talk about your journey and being relentless and what does that look like in your life, uh, your career, all that type of stuff. But the thing that I'm interested in, and you and I have talked about it many times, um, and you actually have spoken at one of my UCAN events about mm-hmm. it, is when you were a young man um, living in Ontario, because originally you're from Ontario. Yeah, moved, um, moved to Alberta in around 95. 95. Are you a Leafs fan? Yeah. I oh, was. Okay. Yeah, that was quickly fixed. That's, yeah, yeah okay. I miss, you know, the DNA changes when you come here. So Absolutely. You just it's get the better. Cold. It's you just the get dry better. cold. You just it's, get better. That's right. You just get better when that's you move right. to Alberta. I never asked you if you were a Leafs fan. I'm glad you're not, though. Yeah, no. One. Um, but uh, when, you were, when you were a young man, you were homeless. Right. And, like, really homeless. Like, like you know. Uh, I'm not, hoping not couch surfing. Not I was, couch surfing uh, yeah. on the street. So, I tell you what. Before we get to that, maybe what we do is talk about uh, uh, like where do you come from? Like, like let's tell a little bit of the okay the, the little Kenny, little story. Kenny, little Kenny. Okay. Um. So little Kenny, uh, Southern Ontario. I kind of grew up throughout Southern Ontario. I grew up in. Um, Initially in Stony Creek, Ontario, uh, near Hamilton, up on the escarpment. We called it the mountain until I understood when I came to Alberta that it was never really a mountain. But uh, I grew up there, uh, middle class family, uh, three uh, siblings, a younger sister and two younger brothers. Um, We were from a broken family. My mom uh, and my natural father uh, divorced when I was pretty young, uh, about nine years old. Um, And he was not a very good human being, uh, at least certainly not at that time. And I don't have a relationship with him now to say if he is or isn't. Uh, but, uh, my mom did meet another fella and, uh, a, a great guy, um, who, uh, took on, I guess at that time there was two siblings, a younger sister, younger brother. The other brother is from the, my mom's second marriage. So just not to be confused, but, um, this fella, uh, Ed Franchek, uh, took on uh, the challenge of three children when he wanted to marry my mom. 
And not only did he take on the challenge, he really took it seriously. This guy was like a certified bachelor. I still sort of remember pieces of it, his big car, and he had sort of a great life going as a bachelor. And he gave it all up uh, to have my, you know, to be with my mom, but uh, more importantly, to take on us as kids. So, it, you know, I was pretty blessed. And that is actually the name that I carry to this day. I was, he adopted my sister, my brother, and I. Um, so he's my dad. Uh, and his name is Ed Franchek. It's interesting. Only... I didn't know that. I yeah, didn't know he's, that uh, yeah. this guy is honest to goodness. He's a saint, absolute saint. Um, so that's uh, uh, early youth. Um, as I started to uh, hit my teens, I was, uh, to say a handful might be an understatement. I was, uh, I was, uh, I just had a lot of trouble, uh, maybe concentrating. I, I was just a difficult kid. And as I got into my early teens, 15, 14, 15 years old, um, I became difficult to manage as a kid. And uh, so I, I kind of hold myself responsible for that. I eat that. Um, and yeah, I, Sorry to interrupt, but when you say that, you were just defiant, you were oh, just off at the world. You yeah. Were, like, there what was, was the deal? Well, there was all of that, but um, in pre, pre-adulthood, there was uh, – you know, there were police involvements and there was all kinds of things. I was, uh, I was doing a lot of things that I shouldn't be doing. Um, never drugs, but, uh, yeah, defiant, to say defiant would be again, an understatement. I mean, social. Well, yeah, a lot of bad things, but, um, that led my folks to, uh, at some point, um, just give up and, uh, they had a full house of other children to deal with. And, uh, and, uh, in the end, uh, just prior to my 16th birthday, I was basically told it's time for you to go. And uh, I won't get into all of that. You know, uh, being a parent now, I'm not sure if I personally would have done things the same way, but uh, they did their best in their day. And and uh, in the end, it is what it is. And is it, I is it fair to say it was a different time as well? It was absolutely right. a different time. Yeah, we you know and. Again, in hindsight, now being an adult, uh, you look back on the pressures that they were probably under uh, and not, you know, that you didn't understand as a kid. You're just being a kid. And um, but obviously now as an adult, you you look back and you say, wow, that must have been a lot for them to deal with. And, and I don't say it was a different time as in like that's acceptable. And no, to no, I understand what they did. But but the way but of thinking was different at back that then. time, which yep. would, I'm assuming was kind of that mid 80s, early 80s, early 80s. Yep. Um, parents did not have the resources. They did not have the, the, what we have now. No. And any trouble, it seems back in those, that era, uh, that was happening behind your closed doors, stayed behind your closed doors. Right. People didn't talk. Uh, so they didn't have, like you said, a lot of places to go to deal with it. Yeah. And they did try. And I remember they did try. Um, but at any rate, um, the long story made short is I ended up, uh, on a Greyhound bus from Hamilton, from, from Stony Creek to downtown Toronto to the Bay street station. And I stepped off of a, a Greyhound coach bus uh, ticket that my aunt had bought me to get me there. And uh, I stepped off the bus with, uh, at the time was, I guess, a lot of money, but $20. And that's all I had. And I had never been to Toronto before. I'd never really been on my own before. And uh, for anyone who knows what, I don't know what it looks like now. That's decades ago. But at that time, it was a hub of activity. There was a lot of people. It was a big city. <laughs> And I stepped off. I didn't know where I was going to go to sleep. I didn't know where I was going to go to eat. I didn't know what I was going to do in the next 10 minutes. You, and, you, <laughs> and you didn't know anybody there? I knew no one. Why did you go there? Well, um, my aunt actually suggested that I get there because there were resources for um, for young people in my situation. But, uh, you know, I won't get into my aunt. She's also <laughs> even more so a saint. Um she did a lot of things to try to help me through that period, but she had her own challenges with her own family. But um, anyways, I guess the, the short version is I still remember the first night I was in College Park Plaza Mall, um, which is at Carlton and Young Street in, uh, in the food court at 11 o'clock at night with no one in there hardly. And uh, there's another story that we won't go into today at all, but... Uh, there was a predator uh, that came upon me and noticed and 
tried to endear himself and uh, offer me a lot to uh, in the first night in the first hours <laughs> those predators anyways wow. um, but that's uh, that's for another day um, ultimately I was asked to leave the the premises because they were closing um, and from that day forward I started staying in hostels and I mean I stayed in Fred Victor Mission I stayed in Seton House I stayed in YMCA uh, stopover which is the the homeless shelter in the basement of the old uh, YMCA building on Carleton it's no longer there it's a police department now but I would imagine it's the jails now actually <laughs> but at any rate um, I was there for a long time uh, and I to be honest I kind of got used to it I just started just it became a lifestyle again I was pretty defiant and it was freedom and um, it's interesting when you're at that age you don't really know what you don't know and you're just trying to find, I think for me, I was trying to find the easiest way to get from point A to point B without having to do anything, to be really honest, right. <laughs> you know, and I found it. I, all I had to do was panhandle. So uh, that's, so I was going to ask you, how did you make money? You were panhandling? I was panhandling. We did some other things we probably shouldn't do. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, basically did anything to get a few bucks. Um, but yeah, I would, it was, uh, I think it was 50 cents to stay at the YMCA stopover and the, the, just to, visualize what that place looked like uh it was in an alley then a, a metal door to walk in there was sort of an intake office where they would greet you kind of thing this place held about i'm going to say, say probably 200 men no women no no girls all men uh or boys um there were uh three distinct halls and then sort of a common area and in each of the halls were steel bunk beds and there were just rows of them, yeah. just rows of them. And in that uh, place, basically, I learned quickly, you sleep on your clothes because you only have one set of clothes. You don't, like, <laughs> you wear the same clothes sometimes literally literally for months. Um, but you sleep on your clothes because if you don't, uh, someone will take them. Yeah. And it actually happened uh, months in. Someone, I woke up in the morning and my clothes were gone and... In a hostel, it's not quite like at mom's house. At 7 a.m., you're out. You don't have your clothes. You're in your underwear. Sorry, you're out. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, the crew that uh, that worked there, um, I'll never forget, they uh, they made their way down to uh, to Salvation Army. And they picked me up a, uh, a dark brown velour sweater, uh, a, a, a pair of... Uh, brown corduroy pants with the big bell bottom on them and i don't know if you remember the old cougar boots with the orange mm -hmm. tongue on them and i wore that for the next three months <laughs> you know so wow. uh, but at least they didn't make me leave uh yeah. you know with with nothing so uh yeah it was it was hardcore and uh during other times it's funny you asked if i was a leaf fan i actually was at that time i mean i grew up in southern ontario yeah. uh, every boy is a leaf fan um, but I used to, for a period of time in the winter, there was a park across from Maple Leaf Gardens and down the street, down college, uh, college or Carleton. Anyways, uh, it's just down the road. You can actually see when a hockey game was coming at the gardens, you could see people walking up across from this park. Well, I lived in that park in cardboard boxes <laughs> during wow. the winter. And I remember I would watch people walk by with their jerseys on. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, oh, to go to a game again, <laughs> you know, right. how amazing would it be? Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's kind of a picture of, a soft picture of what it looked like. Uh, you're saying a soft picture. I, I think you painted oh, a, yeah. a, a I, realistic picture. It's a that very soft said, picture. There's a lot more happening say, down there. <laughs> it was, it's a soft picture. Yep. Um, yep. There's trauma involved there. Yep. There's, there's, there's hard things that you experienced and that you lived through um in that time how long how and we'll get to how you got out of there in a, in a bit but mm -hmm. how long were you i have a question Taz, but how long were you there so basically from about 16 almost 16 yeah i was i was not quite my 16th birthday when i got into a lot of trouble with the law that was when my mom said you're gone and it, it was it, if it wasn't the like the week before my birthday, it was the week after my okay. birthday. It was so in 16. that time period. Till how I was old? On and off till I was about 19. 19. So we're going to look at about three years. Yeah. In that time, the hardships, the toughness, although as you said, there were moments of that where you're like, 
I'm going to do this because I'm, you know, whatever, for whatever you call it, lack of ambition, yep. whatever you want to say. Yep. In your head, though, were you thinking, oh, I have goals in life. I want to do something with my life. I, you know, I'm assuming you weren't doing any schooling at that time. Right. Right. In that moment, see, it's probably not what um, what people would want to hear or what maybe even what you want to hear, given, you know, the reality is that you're working with kids who do have ambition. But if I'm being honest, at that period of time, yes, I did for sure later. But in that first couple of years anyways, for sure, I just didn't. I, I just didn't. I was just going with the flow. Um, but as I... It's funny, I, you look back on it, you, it's hard to even describe timing and to understand it or remember it all. And it, to be honest, it brings up horrible memories. So, so there's, uh, so sometimes it's hard to talk about. But anyways, um, a couple of years in, I started to recognize that I kind of didn't belong there. And it's just, it, it just seemed like, um, it just seemed like I was a little, yeah, sound wrong. I'm just gonna say it the way it's coming out. It, it felt like I was a little smarter than those people. I didn't. Sure. I, I, they, maybe they wanted to be there. Maybe that was all they aspired to do. But I felt like I could probably, if I tried, do a little more. And I, I don't really need to be here. Why am I doing this? There was a, and then there was a couple of key events that kind of really created a transition. And then, funny. And I'm sure we'll talk about it because of the questions you're asking. But as I started to really um, pull myself out with the support of a lot of people, um, it was quick. It was really quick. Like within a year, uh, from age 19 to 20, I, I mean, I went from homeless to I had a job that most of my friends never, the pinnacle they never reached. And it was right. still a you know, that that was a big deal back then. Right. So yeah, and it's interesting. Once I made that, that decision. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate you being vulnerable. Yeah. Well, I just, yeah, it's just, I did, I didn't mean to be, it's just some like you can't talk about this stuff no matter how I try to do it softly or, um, what I'm sharing, my mind is right. still there right. for a minute, which is why I really right. don't like to go into it a lot or very yeah. often. Because that's not who I am anymore. Oh, but yeah. when I think about it, and I really, it, I'm, it, yeah, think about when you were a kid. You remember it. It's, it's the same thing. It just, it, it all comes back. And, there, and it's and powerful. At the, at the end of the day, there's trauma involved. And, yeah, and, for sure and, there is. It was not easy and it was not fun. And right. it, I just, I, I don't, yeah, there's, I'm not a feel sorry for me kind of guy. No. And, I, and I'm not a, uh, I, and I'm not a drama person either. Like, it's not who I am as a person. I hate yeah. drama in my life. and. Yeah. So to make it all how horrible, poor me, poor me, poor me, it's not really. It, it well, just... and, I, and I don't want this to be that kind of a conversation. Yeah, no, no, what, no. What I want it to be. And again, I thank you for being vulnerable. I think that um, the fact that you're willing to talk about it uh, is very generous. And my hope is that somebody uh, listening who might have somebody in their life that's dealing with that, that, that it can bring some hope. Um, that's why I'm here. Exactly. That's why I'm willing to do this. Exactly. Right. And, and <laughs> help somebody. And that's, that's our hope is yeah. that it can Amen, hopefully buddy. give somebody hope. So, so, and you're right, uh, 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 to get out of it in a year. Yeah. That's actually quite rare because you know, we work with a lot of homeless young people. It doesn't happen. It, it takes years and years and years. And yep. so let's, let's, uh, if right now in the podcast, if there was background music, <laughs> it would go to like positive music. <laughs> let's um, play some positive up, music, please. Music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know what, why don't, um, we're going to take a quick little break, a sure. little, uh, little commercial break, we'll call it. And, Great. uh, and when we come back, let's talk about how you got out of that and then where it's led you to now. Those are the days I enjoy. Awesome. Yeah, great. Okay, we'll be right back. I was, I was looking at you guys before I came up, and I'm like, dude, there must be money in dirt, because you guys look nice. Hey, folks, do you like to laugh? Who doesn't like to laugh? The You Can Comedy Nights are a ton of fun, and do they ever make you laugh? Listen, our next You Can Comedy Nights happen in March 2023. If you want all the details on how you can support our incredible organization, You Can Use Services, go to our website for more details. That is at youcancomedy.ca. 
and you can find out all about our shows, our comedians, who's coming in, and all the ways that you can come out and support us. We look forward to having you there, and uh, why don't you come and have some laughs supporting the serious work that we do at You Can Use Services. And now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to the show. We're here with Ken Franchuk, uh, Crystal Glass General Manager. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We we just talked about uh, your early kind of your early childhood and your teens dealing with homelessness, uh, the hardships, the realness of that, and now we're going to talk about how you got out of that, and then what brought you because you were in Toronto. What brought you out to Western Canada? So tell us tell us that moment where it was like boom i need to i need to change my life here okay well there's a bunch of changes one is at 18 and another one's a decision to move out west with my family um i'll keep the version of getting my head together and off the street because i think it's probably more um related to the podcast you're doing which is um as i said i was starting to kind of get my head wrapped around the fact i probably didn't belong here i don't really think i want to be here anymore but I had an aha moment. Um, interesting, you, I'm sure, have seen this. The community, the street community, are very tight. Uh, they take care of each other. They, they're aware of each other, and they pay attention to each other. And oftentimes, not only that, they'll link up. Like, uh, two people will just connect, and they'll just pay attention. They, they, it's like family. It's like it yeah. is family, yeah. um, and oftentimes um, one of the folks, one of the kids, one of the people who have got more time and experience being there, tend to see somebody who's vulnerable and attach themselves, not for negative reasons, but to protect them. Protect. You've seen this, yeah, yeah. So you you know that this is a very real thing. So I had a fellow like that, who I distinctly remember, um, just. We didn't see each other every day. It wasn't like that, but he paid attention and knew. And when something, like, because a lot of things go wrong when you're down there. <laughs> I'll just, uh, that predatory story, I have yeah. dozens of them like yeah. that and, and um, that are much worse. And so you pay attention. So this fella kind of paid attention to me and kind of mentored. I don't even know what the word is. Yeah. He was kind of a quiet guardian, whatever. Um, but one day, one night, um, just off Young Street, and I was with a couple of guys, and we're making our way up the street, <clears throat> and there was police tape, and a bunch of policemen there, and of course, you're a street kid, you know, whatever we referred to them, and we were laughing about it, and whatever, and carrying on, but as we got closer, uh, it quickly noticed that someone had passed in the vestibule, and that's what the police tape was for, and it was winter, and as it turned out, it was the fellow who uh, had been watching over me. Hmm. And he, uh, I don't really know if he had a heart attack or if he passed from exposure or what happened. Right. I just know that he passed in a vestibule of a business, a retail business, sitting there, exposed to the elements. And I was like, this, this is not where I'm supposed to be. That was the aha moment. Then the work started yeah. because, and it wasn't like the next day. It wasn't like a sitcom or a TV show. It, it was a time and more little things happened. And I thought, okay, well maybe. So I went and found a, comp a group back then. It doesn't exist anymore, but very similar to yours called Mercury Youth Services. And they had a, back in the day, a, f a bank of phones. So you could call and try and get interviews and they would give you tokens so that you could go on the TTC to go get a job and, you know, they just, they, they, and then they had a little bit of counseling and, and just how to handle yourself in a job interview. And it's very, very similar yeah, to the things yeah. that you do in your organization. So they were very supportive. And uh, uh, over time, I got lucky enough. It was a horrible recession uh, in, in uh, Ontario at the time. I remember I went to this, I went to so, so many companies, but I went to one. Back then, you would go and fill out a, an application form in person. It wasn't like it is now. And I went to this place, Ginger's Baths, in uh, East on uh, East Eglinton, 945 Eglinton Avenue. You still remember. Nice. Um, Ginger's Baths. And uh, I, I met this guy, and I filled out this application form, and he takes it, and he puts it, I'm not exaggerating, on a stack. And these are single forms. Like, like a foot high. A foot high. Yeah. And, sats, <clears throat> and I'm going to leave, and I'm thinking, there's, like, I'm not going to get this job. Yeah. So I... This guy ends up being a real mentor and friend in the long run because he does hire me. But I said to him, I said, listen, 
he says, well, if I, if he said, I, if you get the job, I'll call you. I said, well, that's kind of a trick. I don't have a phone. Um, but I'll tell you what, if it's okay with you, I'll just call you back tomorrow and see if the job's been filled. So he gave me his name and I called him and he, I did that he, first day. He's like, no, the job, job's not filled. I'm just busy. We're, I'll get to it. And I did it again and I did it again and I did it again. And it was about a week of calling this guy every single day. And I would panhandle for a dime, put it in the, <laughs> in the pay phone and I would call him, Dan, it's Ken. And uh, finally he said on the phone and then he hired me, he said, listen, he said, I still haven't had time to to even look at these application forms, but anybody who's willing to call you, relentless, anybody who's willing to call me every single day for a week, I got to at least give you a shot. And he did. And again, on this podcast and in my world and the way, that's called being relentless. Absolutely. And I was in height, like that's the perfect word for him because I I would not give up. And uh, unless he said no. So I took on this job and my job was to drill holes in bathtubs uh, this is hilarious. So I'm a st- literally a street kid. I have no money. Um, I'm wearing the same clothes to work every day, and I'm coming to work at Ginger's Bass. Well, Ginger's Bass was a super, super high-end uh, bathroom outfitting company okay. that brought product in from France and from Paris and from oh, wow. Italy. And I'm in these bathtubs cutting holes in them to make them into whirlpools. These tubs are worth, back then in the early 80s, are worth like $2,000. Wow. <laughs> and I can't afford 50 cents to get... To, to sleep at those, but I did it. And uh, so I, uh, there's another story associated with that. Uh, Dan Erklins became very, very pivotal in helping me uh, uh, transition off the street. He actually allowed me to stay at his home with he and his fiance before they were married in a little one bedroom apartment. Um, and he was just, he, he recognized, he actually approached me one day and said, Ken, I'm sorry, I got to ask. So other people are asking, you've been here for like two weeks and you're still wearing the same clothes. Like I got to ask. I said, I said, yeah, I don't, this is all I have. I don't, I just go back and I, and I stay at the hostel. I was waiting for my first check. And he said, you what? I, he, he didn't know. And uh, he said, well, that's not happening. Yeah. You're not going back there. And that was so the first is, night I slept on somebody's couch so Dan, at least. So Dan, Dan is, was, is, I believe that you called the, uh, the gentleman that passed away a protective guardian. Yeah. Right. Dan's a very well, instrumental a, person in your life. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. You know, it. Uh, none of this ha- ever happens just on your own uh, gumption. It happens based on a lot of support and a yeah. lot of people recognizing you need help and a willingness to accept that help because that's another real challenge for yeah. when you're young, you think you know it all. Uh, and uh, when we're old, I <laughs> think we know it all and we don't accept isn't that, it. Like, isn't that the truth? To me, it's you are so correct on the willingness to accept help wherever you are is yeah. so important in our lives yeah. but it's a difficult thing to do yeah. it's just a pride thing and i think it's also a bit of an arrogance thing for me it was because mm-hmm. yeah, you know to speak truthfully i'm a pretty confident guy and i have that part of me has always been in my dna yeah. i thought i knew it all you know yeah. even though i knew nothing at any rate so he helped me out so that was a transition off the street and from that um i, I worked for that company for a little while doing the bathtubs got cleaned up within a year I, you know i was kind of back into society and and uh, went into sales from sales i actually went to a different company where i was recruited <laughs> to be an operations manager uh of a, of a big warehouse and it just kind of everything started to happen really quickly yeah. um but i worked really hard and and i was confident and and humbly i i i think i I possess the business acumen I still have today. I just, in my youth, I just didn't know how to channel it. And so it was what it was. <clears throat> so there's that part of the transition off the street. Moving out to, out west, by that time, I was married, had two young children. My son was three and my daughter was six months old. So how old were you at this time? So just uh, back up for one sec. Sorry. You transition out. I'm like Dan, 19 then. So so Dan's like... Hugely important, plus of other a bunch of other. People. Oh, so many! You're working, you're working, laddering your way up into some different places. Yeah. Now you've got, I'm assuming, uh, uh, more than one set of clothes. Yes. You're, you've got your <laughs> own place. I met a great you're, girl. You met a great girl. We got married. Got married. You're having had a children. couple of kids. And then I decided I was going to be uh, always been entrepreneurial. Uh, I had some skills that I just acquired over the years. Um, basic home improvement type skills. So I opened a small home improvement company with a partner. Uh, we did that for a couple of years and we made a living. 
I mean, we didn't, we weren't getting rich by any stretch, but we made a living and had big dreams. Um, but then, uh, yet again, another change in the economy and the GST was introduced and it really had a huge effect in Ontario in particular on things such as home improvements, where all of a sudden now there was a 15% total tax on anything you bought. So the hundred dollar jobs now 115, the thousand dollar jobs now 1150, the business just started to tank. So we started doing some cash work and it was getting to be too much cash. And I thought, we're going to get into trouble with the government. I didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. So I walked away. My partner wanted to stay on. He did it. Uh, I started making phone calls out West to see if I could find a job. And they kind of laughed at me on the phone and said, we don't actually hire if you're not here with no experience, but if you come to Alberta. So I packed up my, uh, my six-month-old daughter and my three-year-old son and my wife and with the money we had left over from the business uh, and selling all of most of our stuff, we had a little trailer. Um, we moved out west and we had, uh, my sister's uh, brother and wife lived in Canmore. So let's go to Canmore. Now, the funny part of that is I, I was trying to find a job in oil. I thought, oil, I'll go be a laborer somewhere. I'll make lots of money. I hear about it, you know. Yeah. So we end up moving to Alberta. We moved to Canmore. <laughs> well, there's not a lot of oil drilling going on in Canmore. No. So, uh, so we did that for a while, uh, stayed there for a while. Uh, I took on any job. I was bartending I was and bar say, managing. You're, you're probably and, in tourism. Um, and then I started uh, working not very long after in the glass business. And I started with a different company than Crystal Glass, we a smaller bring one. them up. No, not no. their name. But I did work for them. Yeah. And, uh, and then after a while, that didn't work. And someone told me, if you're real serious about the glass business, you need to go see these people at Crystal Glass because they're the guys. So I walked in in uh, 97, October of 97, asked for a job, and they gave me a job as a CSR. Thank you for calling Crystal Glass. This is Ken speaking. And uh, so this is this is 25 years ago. 25 years ago, yeah, you, my my anniversary with Crystal Glass was October 27th. Wow, like yeah, just 25th passed. silver anniversary wow, with them. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's been an amazing <laughs> journey. For, um, they uh, they treated me well. I did some things right. I worked really hard. Uh, I gave up a lot of family time. That's where I give credit to my. But you ex-wife. started on the phones. I started in the lowest position in the company. There was probably 400 employees at the time. It was a pretty big company, and uh, but I do remember saying about a year or two in, it was just that I wanted to be a manager. That was all. And I remember saying to one of my coworkers, I was working a Saturday, like the fifth Saturday in a row or something, and I didn't want to be there, and he didn't want to be there. And I said, the only reason I do this stupid thing is eventually I'm going to manage one of these stores. And he laughed. He said, oh, you don't get it. Yeah, it's not how it works here. You got to have like decades, and that uh, I've tried for years. So, well, you do you, and I'll do me. Because yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll manage one of these yeah. stores. And he he didn't stay forever like I did, but uh, but I know him, and if he ever watches this, he's going to remember that conversation. Yeah, and it worked out. I, I managed a shop or two. Or so, all of it. So <laughs> eventually. Well, again, in a relentless fashion. I never gave up. You never gave up? I never, ever gave up. I gave, in 2002, I was given an opportunity. I'd had a couple of small little victories and given some opportunity to manage at a lower level. And I had this, um, this vision of uh, two or three of the core things that we do as a business that were just not organized enough, in my opinion. Uh, like Canadian wide, there was one location here, one location in Saskatchewan and one, and, and it just wasn't, it wasn't efficient. And at that time, the leader of our company was a fellow named Ed Bean, who's an absolute legend and an incredible human being. Legend um, in this community. Absolute legend. Legend. I'm so blessed that I got to work with him for so many years, so yeah. closely. But I remember because I, the building I was in was the same building that Ed worked in. And I don't even know if I had more than just said good morning quietly as he would walk good by. Morning, yeah, and he would go to his big desk in his office yeah. and I would go over here and work like a kid that I should. Yeah. But when I had this vision, I went to him one day and I just do a little, excuse me, Mr. Bean on his door. Said, yeah. I said, uh, I have this idea and I'm talking to him from the door and it's like from, it's from here across the room <laughs> to his desk and I have this idea and I think if we did this and this and this and brought them together, I just believe we could be more efficient, but it would take a real investment and 
And he says, really? Why don't you come in and close the door? So I came in. I closed the door. <laughs> Never forget. I don't know if it was strategic or not, but I've, I've read books since, and I think it might have been. But he's not a huge man by stature. But for some reason, when I sat in that chair across from him, he was huge, he was huge. <laughs> across yeah. in this giant desk. His just, feet are dangling yeah. in the chair, but you, but you can't see it from his desk. I'm just looking up at him, yeah. and, I, and I said, uh, you know, so he asked me more questions, and, and I told him more about what I thought I saw. And he says, uh, you know, kid, I've been waiting years for somebody to recognize that. He said, you think you can handle the project? Fortunately, I had no idea what I was signing up for. So, yes, sir, I certainly can. And that's, again, part of being he, relentless. And then, and then did he go, uh, what was your name again? <laughs> yeah, that was basically <laughs> it. No, really, it was. We, let me get your name again yeah. so I can put it on, yeah, yeah. on the project. But he, um, he, I, there was no way I was going to say no. It yeah. was this, it was ended up being a $10 million project. It was a brand new building and I got to design the building and design the equipment and search literally the world for for specific manufacturing equipment and how to lay it out and lean manufacturing and all these things I'd never done any of that in my life never done any of that and I just thought I'll learn you know and I did and he trusted you yeah I had I'd had some small victories previously yeah. so he had recognized at the very least that I'm not a quitter, right. and and if I say I'll do it, I'll make sure I do it, right. whether it kills me. Which which builds trust, it builds equity, right? Yeah. And I love that story. I didn't know that. It was that. so awesome. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, so that was sort of my big move in the company, and that was in 2002. And by 2008, another series of events, some of our senior staff were aging. And, and again, you know, relentless and vision, I remember recognizing very clearly and saying to my wife at the time, I'm going to run this company. Yeah. I am sure I'm going to run this company. And I could even put a timeline on it. And she's like, oh, honey, yeah, babe. Yeah, I know you're going to take over the world. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, no, really? And that was part of the challenge in our relationship actually was that um, I believed I had vision and I and I would do anything. <laughs> it's ridiculous to keep coming back to this, but relentless. I was keep relentless. I was not going to stop. Right. And as a result, Right or wrong, in hindsight, I um, I put more attention into business than I did into my family for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, Which I think is actually common at times. I think so. For someone who's really ambitious anyways, yeah. you know, and, and there's a lot of guys like me, yeah. we tend to lose our sense of priorities. And sure. as, as I'm getting older and getting closer to 60 than 50 in my age, I'm starting to look back and, and you know, would I have done some things differently? There's no question I would. My family is extremely important to me. Yeah. And I may not have been always there the way I should have been, but I was doing what I thought I needed to do. But that's a whole other story. The point is, on that business side, I put everything into it. And as a result, here we are, you know, 25 years later. It was 2008 when I was asked if I'd take a more senior leadership role in the company. So at that point, I'd only been with the company for 11 years. Well, that was unheard of in our organization. Yeah. So, um, so I'm proud of that. And uh, and honestly, uh, since then, I'm extremely proud of the growth um, that I feel personally responsible for with a, a fantastic team of people, of course. Um, but I believe it's a lot of it is my vision. You lead them. Uh, yeah, yeah, humbly, I I do. That's my role. Is you know, yeah. I'm not good at anything. I try to be. Adequate at everything. And you have people yeah. that are good at a lot of things. I have a great team. Oh, that's what I'm good at, I've probably, met, if nothing else. Team there. Good. I, so I can pick good people. You that's... became the GM in what year then? Uh, it was 08 or 09. 08 or 09. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the thing, Ken. You are, luckily for Crystal Glass, you are the face of the organization. Uh, luckily for and, me. And, and, well, luckily for you, but I say that luckily for them just because I'm the face of you, Ken. Your services, <laughs> man. <laughs> Oh, that's tough to for people to understand. I but, felt like honestly, when I looked at you the first time, I thought this is the leader who represents you. Can if yeah. I'm going to be a true leader, I should shave my head. Yeah, hundred percent. You know that was my first thought. I know, and and it's, <laughs> I I don't have to. 
I, I know. Um, it's the Bruce Willis. I understand. Yeah, You're like, handsome, man. Uh, yeah, I just so quit. Do it. So quit knocking know, yourself down. Always, you are a fantastic tease about, representation tease about of your group. Me. Well, we're on a podcast. I have a face for a podcast. But Amen. You are, when I say the face, you are in commercials. You yeah. are on the radio. You, I, it's, it's, you need to it's, understand. No, it's awesome. I love it. You're Because you're going to be like, shut up. Don't talk about that. I, I hate hilarious. it. I think it's you, hilarious. You don't understand how hard I push back to not do that for how long I push back not to do that ed bean had been the face of the company yeah. for decades yeah. decades and decades and still is the company yeah. i mean ed is i'm i'm here ed's here uh because yeah, be very owns clear it, that's a lot of people think you own crystal glass no i i own some shares he right ed's very very generous and he's allowed a our entire team to buy into yeah. the company, but he's he and the Bean family own yeah. the company, yeah. the majority of it for sure. <laughs> How many crystal glasses are there? There's now I just acquired another retail recently, so there's 49 retail. Uh, those are spread uh, through Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. Wow. Then there's uh, 13 warehouses, uh, which are wholesale divisions, which are a pretty significant portion of our business. Uh, then we have two manufacturing facilities: one in Edmonton, one in Swift Current. Uh, we have a commercial division in Edmonton and in Calgary. And then we have some other business interests as well outside of that yeah. that we've kind of invested in as a group. Yeah. 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 Pretty, pretty incredible. And uh, like it's, it's a big 600 employees and wow. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, does it does millions well. and millions a lot and of millions work. of dollars. It's a it's a lot of responsibility, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. But I love it. I love every day. Oh, yeah. no, I love I, I every day. I know you do. You and I, we do talk, and and we get together. We usually have a nice steak and yep. stuff for lunch. And I I know you love your job. You're yeah. passionate about it. Um, and I also know that you're passionate about the people that work there, which is great. Your story to me <clears throat> is it's a story of of a lot of things, but. Two things to me is is that relentless aspect and the resiliency aspect. Resiliency and relentless to me are siblings. They, they, they go together. And we're actually in our podcast, we're going to talk more about resiliency as we move along. We've got a few guests lined up that are that we've got one, hopefully that's actually an expert in resiliency. And like, you know, it, it's listen, when we talk about what your what your folks did in the early 80s, um, Let's be honest. It was a normal thing to do, mm -hmm. and because back in those days, it was like pull up your bootstraps, let's go get Absolutely. your shit together. I mean, that's the way that. Can even I our can generation. I interject too? Uh, I will tell you if I had to relive it all over again, I have to give credit to my folks and those experiences that brought me to this place, mm -hmm. because very likely down a different parallel path in life i would not be who i am today right and and i you know that sounds cliche but it's it's legit the the some of the most important lessons i learned on dealing with people resiliency um you know so many lessons that you learn in that environment during that period of your life um i feel set me up sure for today sure so i when i look back i mean i don't the heartache part of it is was difficult, but the the um, but the education level of it, the life experience. It's interesting because uh, education wise, yeah. What do you have? I uh, I finally got my uh, SSGD equivalency, and uh, and then took a couple of night college courses. That was it. I was a dropout of high school originally, and four grade nine credits. I, some people won't like this. <laughs> that to me is such a beautiful part of this story. I'm all for education. Mm -hmm. So I am, am I. All for yep. education. Yep. Um, but I like. But it's not everything. It's not everything. And where you may have lacked some formal education, you you know. Don't people, think I wasn't educated. Exactly, it was just done differently. Exactly. Your education came from just the the stuff we talked about earlier, and again without your folks oops sorry doing what they did um you're right your path would have been different and again that goes back to being resilient which can then bring on relentlessness absolutely um you panhandling for a dime every day for a week to call that guy um led you to where you are today in my opinion and i agree 100 i think it's an incredible story thank you now before yeah. we wrap up 
Um, you're also involved in a bunch of other things. Like well, since I've known you, you, you're like always got your hands in stuff like MMA stuff. Right. Um, you are owner or part owner of a butcher shop. Yeah. You like you're just. Kind of <laughs> I, over the it's map. funny. My world is random. Well, yeah, really. Uh, so the boxing and the MMA thing comes just from passion. Um, I spent a, a few years in a local boxing club, the Cougar Boxing Club here in Edmonton, with my son. And like anything, it transitions from something of interest where you're supporting your kid. For a guy like me, it transitions to business. I just what happens. I ended up managing a couple of fighters. Here we are years later. My partner uh, at the firm sports management, Mark Pavlich, he had a huge, uh, uh, a massive global uh, MMA empire. And as a result, he had athletes coming to us and we ended up starting up a business to manage pro fighters. So we've had guys in the UFC and yeah. all kinds of fun there. I bought uh, with my son-in-law a meat shop uh, in the west end of Edmonton. Meat, meathead? Meathead. I just love the it's name. It's awesome. Meathead. But it, it's, it's good. It's, uh, you know what? Recently, we have over 300 five-star reviews on mm -hmm. Facebook. It's this, it's this 1,500 square foot meat shop yeah. in west Edmonton. But, but it is that good. But it is that good. I'm I've so been there. proud of it. No, it should Thank be. You. And I know I don't look like a guy that eats a lot of No, meat. no. I, I no. look like a guy that eats a lot of vegetables and stuff. Yeah. But, but I'm telling you, uh, the meatloaf yeah. is my favorite. How about balls? Yeah. Oh, they're awesome. Oh, but the meatloaf so is my favorite. And then I actually, you guys do that donair sausage. Oh, donair sausage. <laughs> it's so wrong, it. but it's so right. Yeah. And well, thanks so for the plug, buddy. No, I meat, really do like meathead. it. Meathead. Meathead. Yeah, Where's the meathead. camera? Go to meathead. Um, I also um, have, uh, what else do I have? Uh, I have a holding company uh, where I have some property. Mm -hmm. um, I have a business coaching business that I've been pretty inactive in the last couple of years. COVID Not really COVID affected that. Head, yeah. And I've just, frankly, I'm just so busy. It's difficult yeah. to get at it. Yeah. But uh, I do enjoy doing that because it's sort of one-on-one -on -one mentoring with uh, with young entrepreneurs. So I do that. And yeah. I don't know. I have other things too. I have always something going on. You're a busy guy. You're an entrepreneur. And it's fun. And you are truly I'm blessed. relentless. I'm blessed. You are. I'm blessed. You are. But, but to, to wrap up here, what, again, where you and I met is that you are a philanthropist. Yep. You uh, truly do give uh, Crystal Glass and you, I know individually, personally as well, uh, give a lot of resources. It's not always about money, but a lot of resources to many places with across Western Canada. And uh, I know that you can use services. We're very lucky that you have picked us. And We're that, lucky. That, well, I appreciate No, that. honestly, Kyle, stop. You're right. Uh, Crystal Glass supports a lot of programs. I personally, when I can, try to either monetarily or with my time to support a number of groups. But the minute you think that you're the, the lucky one, <laughs> we're the lucky ones. Listen, I get to go to work every day. I do my job. I go home. Uh, you know, I have business BS to deal with. There's that kind of thing. You guys, you live and breathe that stuff, and um, we're the ones who are lucky. And I, I'm, I swear to you, I'm not just like anybody watching. I'm not just saying this. I, it sounds again sort of cliche, but it's a fact. These guys, if you knew what they do to work with kids, you know, it can be so thankless for you guys and so difficult. But I know the victories are massive. We're the ones who are lucky, pal. Well, I, I and that. I appreciate you, and a lot of people do. I do. I That's why I'm here. That. Believe me. Yeah, I, would, no. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't you. No, That's and I fact. appreciate that. Listen, we try to end every podcast with a quote. Do you have Do you, do you have a favorite quote? Now, I'm putting you on the spot. We have one, but if you have a favorite well, one, that's awesome. No, you asked me for a quote, but I, I, like to me, relentless is. Um, oh can, no, we're gonna talk. Oh, about you don't want to do that. Oh, you want to do that no, later? No, this well, you is just an want a quote, quote like, from like Ken an inspiring Franchise? quote. Oh, don't do that no, at I, the I'm, end. No, no, I have one. I'm saying I have let's one. Let's hear okay, one so, of mine, one that I've said no, to you. No, no, no. It's not one of yours. <laughs> Come on. Well, well, let's put my name on it anyway. Okay, we'll put Make your name on it. Make me sound smart. Go ahead. Uh, this is one that we found. It says, you don't become unstoppable by following the crowd. You get there by doing something better than anyone else can do and proving every day why you are the best at what you can do. I don't even know who said it, but I like that. And it is about going against the grain sometimes. It's about proving yourself, working hard, being relentless. And when you think yep. of when you think of your entire life story, uh, but let's just look at Crystal Glass. There was that there when you started. Hello, five hundred employees. Hello, thank you for me. calling Crystal Glass. Yeah. This is Ken. How can I help you? To now, you run it. You are you, you, and and. 
that only took 11 years. And then what you've done with the it's pretty impressive, man. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your vulnerability. Anytime, Um, pal. For you, anything, man. You're a good friend. I appreciate you. Yeah, so right back at you. Uh, stick around. We're going to do a couple more things. Where can we find you on social media? Oh, man. I, you, everything's sort of related to Ken Franchek. So, yeah. Uh, you know, you're on you, Twitter. You're on the. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm the, on. I got YouTube. I don't know. I Google, don't know Google, Google my name. Yeah. There's a ton of stuff there. I was, was shocked one day when somebody said, you should Google yourself. And I went, holy time. Yeah. I didn't realize all that was on there. But you're on all the social media. Yes, sir. I am. Um, and you can find me. It's typically my last name. If you search that, you'll find all kinds of stuff. Okay. Awesome. And uh, if you want to, if you want to learn more about uh, you can use services, please go to our website website at uh, www.ucan.ca and uh, we're on the socials as well at UCAN Edmonton. Ken, thanks again. I look forward to seeing you soon and uh, I appreciate you being here. Love you, brother. All right. Love you too, man. Thanks. Thanks.